Hi, it's Dave. So Elon Musk just confirmed what he's paying in taxes, and I'm gonna go through that in this video. But also, I wanna pose this question. Like, is all this noise around Elon Musk's Tesla stock sale really important, or is it just a distraction to Tesla shareholders? So I wanna look at this from different angles. On one angle, yeah, I think it can be a distraction. It is noise. What's the big deal, right? It doesn't have to deal with the fundamentals of Tesla. Tesla as a company still has an amazing long-term growth potential, 2022 is shaping up to be a fantastic year. And it seems like all this drama around Elon selling stock uh, shares doesn't really matter. But on the flip side, I wanna pose a different angle. And the angle I wanna pose is, actually I think it does matter in the bigger picture. It doesn't have to deal with necessary Tesla stock, but it deals with bigger economic, social, and political issues at hand. So I'm gonna go ahead and go through a tweet thread that um, Elon actually confirmed a lot of these numbers. So we'll go ahead and I'm gonna share kind of what Elon Musk is paying in taxes, but more importantly, I wanna speculate on why I think it is a big issue and why Elon actually cares a lot about bringing this to attention. So I say, um, here's a breakdown of Elon Musk's tax rate when exercising his stock options. These are from 2020, 2012. Um, he got um, the right to exercise 22.8 million shares. Um, at a very, very low stock price of like $6 or so. And because these are non-qualified stock options, they're considered uh, income compensation. So he needs to pay income tax, not long-term capital gains. His federal tax is 33, 37%. California state tax is 13.3%. Medicare is 1.45%. And Medicare, there's a supplemental tax at certain income levels, and that is 0.9%. So his total tax rate, is 52.65%, right? And this is on um, these exercised or these shares he needs to exercise by August, 2022. Now, if the stock price is 1050 or $1,050 and Elon exercises 22.8 million of these shares, that would be worth $24 billion, which of he would need to give the government $12.6 billion or he would need to sell over half of those shares and give it to the government. All right, so I say that Elon's non-qualified stock options uh, would be considered as compensation, so there's no 3.8% net investment income tax. That's for more investments. This is more compensation that Elon's doing. Um, but he would pay Medicare taxes. And I say, who would have thought back in 2012 when Elon first got this um, compensation plan that the government of all entities would be the big winner, would actually get over 50% right, of the gains of Elon's uh, stock windfall. I say um, Elon's 2018 CEO compensation plan. Now this is a second CEO compensation plan that Tesla approved in 2018. Now this is for a much larger amount of shares. This is for approximately 101 million shares that Elon can exercise by January 2028. And here's the breakdown of the taxes that Elon will pay when he exercises these second lot, right, of, of Tesla shares. He'll pay a 37% federal uh, income tax. He'll pay a 1.45% uh, Medicare tax. He's gonna pay a 0.9% Medicare supplemental tax. Then he's gonna pay a possible 5% surtax over $10 million adjusted gross income. What this is, this is a new tax in the Biden reconciliation bill that hasn't been completely finalized, but at the current moment, this is, the, the text and the language that um, has been agreed upon, but we'll see if it's signed into law. And then there's an additional 3% of adjusted gross income over $25 million. So what this means is this additional five and three or 8% is charged both to long-term and short-term right, income. Um, so it's 8% across the board. And so Elon's tax rate would be 47.35% uh, per, uh, um, on these additional shares that he would um, exercise um, by 2028. Um, and I go ahead and I, and I say that his 2018 compensation plan needs to be exercised by January 28, 28 and could equal approximately 101 shares, 101 million shares. And if Tesla is at $5,000 at that time, which to me is actually you know, a reasonable projection, the government would net $293 billion in taxes, right? And I say, surprise, the government is a huge big winner if and when Tesla stock rises. So this is a, a very interesting kind of observation here. If Tesla stock, stock skyrockets, right, and really does a double, triple, even a 5X, you know, in the next, let's say, seven years, um, 
probably the biggest winner, one of the biggest winners is the government because they're taking 47% of, you know, Elon's entire 101 million share uh, compensation. To give you some context, Tesla's outstanding shares is only uh, 1 billion shares. So 100 million is like 10% of the outstanding shares. So the government's taking half of that, which is a huge uh, windfall for the government. Um, some people might say, but Elon gets to keep 52.65%, right, of the 101 million shares. But yeah, that's true. But those shares will eventually be taxed at Elon's death but if he keeps them. Um, and even if he sells them, like whatever he transfers or holds onto, his whole estate will be taxed at a 40% estate tax rate. That's the current rate in the U.S. And I think it's actually going to be um, higher in the future. I think it could go up to 50%, even 60%, who knows? But all in all, even at the 40% ta uh, estate tax rate, the government will end up taking a total, if you include the uh, tax at exercise and include the estate tax, it will be uh, 69 million shares out of 101 million shares the government will end up taking, right, from Elon Musk. So it's almost 70%. I say, uh, maybe I made a mistake in all these calculations. The government actually takes 69.420%. Uh, and then, then I go on and I say, if we bump up the state tax in the U.S. to 20 or 50%, which I think is likely coming, then out of the 101 million shares from Elon's 2018 compensation plan, the government will end up taking 74.4 million shares or 73.6%. So that is nearly three quarters, right, of the 101 million shares that Elon gets awarded will end up in uh, government hands. Um, Elon Musk says accurate thread as a response to all this. So it's kind of interesting. He's saying, yeah, these numbers actually are accurate, which is kind of crazy. Like, like I'm doing the numbers and they make sense to me. And I'm like, yeah, they're accurate. But a lot of people, I get pushback of like, oh no, you know, he can't possibly be paying all that, right? But yeah, if you just work out the numbers of the current tax rates and how much, right, that works out to be, and you actually also include the state taxes at his death, you'll see how much of Elon's uh, wealth will be taxed and end, um, end up with the government. Uh, Shibatoshi Nakamoto, a Dogecoin founder, says not to mention the many billions of dollars that the existence of Tesla has given the government. And Elon replies to that and says, indeed, over time, Tesla will generate hundreds of billions of dollars for the government in terms of employee income tax, product sales tax, property tax, in addition to profit taxation. Yeah, so Elon's talking about a lot of things here. Um, I actually follow up and says, yeah, there's stock gains right, that they're taxing stock options, employee income, the product in terms of sales tax, the properties, right, all that, the machinery, all this stuff, you tax, you're taxing the final profits of the, of the company as well. There's a ton the government is taxing and is benefiting actually from Elon um, generating a lot of value and Tesla uh, generating a lot of value. I want to just go through uh, several comments that, you know, just people wrote on the thread just to kind of give some different angles. Uh, Chris Guthrie says, I'd love the millionaire billionaire hatred to evolve beyond eat the rich to question um, where our tax dollars being spent, uh, where are, are our tax dollars being spent and why the government is so inefficient in with what they take. Um, yeah, you know, I think lost in the debate of like our billionaires paying their fair share of taxes is like, yeah, what are we doing with our taxes and can we use them in a more efficient manner? Um, Michael Hugh. Uh, says people aren't taking the time to understand how the tax code works and it's easier to assign blame elsewhere. I've realized this because even highly educated friends are confused. They haven't fully factored the numbers into their viewpoints. Yeah, and I think that's a valid point. A lot of people might accuse Elon Musk of like shirking on taxes, but if you work out the numbers of what he's paying in terms of the 22.8 billion or 22.8 8 million shares he's exercising now, and then the 101 million shares he has to exercise, you know, within seven years, you'll see, or actually a little over six years, you'll see that the amount is actually 50%. It works out, you know, basically around that amount where that's Elon's tax rate for the majority, right, of what he's going to be um, um, compensated for. And um, yeah, it's a huge tax burden. If you just look at it, you'll see that, yeah, of all people, I don't think Elon's the right person for people to be the poster child, child of shirking taxes. He's going to be um, probably the person who gives the most taxes um, in history. 
um, after it's all said and done. Um, Kyle Court says, Elon sometimes does outrageous things. I wonder if he is intentionally aiming to pay the most taxes in one year for one person ever. Um, in an absolute uh, money, money amount, yeah, I think that's uh, likely. Um, he might even do two years in a row, this year and next year. Um, and then he'll follow up, right, with uh, f future years with his uh, 2018 compensation plan exercising. Um, if so, the government should send a nice plaque hand signed by the President of the United States and Treasury Secretary. <laughs> I don't think that's happening. The, go the, the government, the, the President won't even invite Elon Musk to the table with other, other EV makers, right, on EV uh, day, and they won't even give a congratulatory message to Elon Musk with SpaceX. Um, I don't think he's getting a plaque anytime soon. Um, Jane says, um, the government has inflated Tesla stock like no other stock on record. Quantitative easing, low interest rates, tax breaks for EVs, just a few. Tax Tesla stock would trade around $40 without these. <laughs> I disagree with the $40 number, but um, I, I don't disagree that, yeah, quantitative easing as, as inflated assets across the board, we have so much money chasing a few assets. It's not just Tesla stock. Look at real estate, look at equities across the board. Um, and yeah. Um, and this is a complicated subject. I think a lot is, is given to um, the so-called subsidies that Tesla received. And I think if you look into them, like, yeah, Tesla, whatever subsidies Tesla received, they were, uh, I think, far few compared to the oil subsidies and other subsidies other industries get. Um, Anyways, Christopher Gilmore says, can you imagine working 100 hours week per week for years, many of them on the, many times on the verge of bankruptcy, only to have half of your pay taken from you by a government? And then if that's not enough, you're berated by politicians and college professors for not paying your fair share. So he, the context is actually, yeah, folks like Bernie Sanders and Robert Reich and Ron White and others who are very influential in, in, in the Senate have basically lashed onto Elon Musk as this poster child of a billionaire not paying his fair share. And if you work out the numbers, that's just not the case, right? Um, yeah, if you pay 50% and then also 40% right, goes at, at, at your death and you're paying like you know, 75% or something of your shares. And that's not all of his shares, but for a good chunk of his shares. I don't think that, um, um, to me, that's, that's a decent amount. You know, once you get over 50% of your total assets going to the government, um, yeah, it's, it's a good, good, good amount. Um, all right, so let's take a step back and I just wanna give some kind of different angles to kind of wrap all this stuff. Um, I actually think we have a bigger problem and problems brewing here. And we've got a recent chain of events over the past few years that are very concerning to me. And I think a large part of it was triggered and incited with COVID. And the government, rather than taking a proactive, quick you know, action plan to, to, to have masks everywhere and early testing, rather the government kind of you know, uh, rejected masks early on and, and, and extensive testing. And they refused to follow the example of, of countries that were doing a great job, like South Korea and others, who didn't have to shut down their economy, right? Like a lot of people um, think that, oh, it's inevitable all countries had to shut down their economies. No, that's not the case. There were, you know, a good number of countries who were competent enough to handle the crisis in a way where, no, they didn't have to shut down, you know, most of their economy. But the U.S., through different big errors, and I think it's a lot of just inept leadership, was forced in a way to shut down vast parts of their economy. And as a result, now you've got a bigger problem at hand. And the U.S. was forced to print a lot of money and inject a lot of money into the system to keep things alive, to, think, to keep th things from spiraling out of control. Now, we know that with money printing and quantitative easing, that over the past decade or more, that the benefits have been disproportionately realized by those with assets, meaning those people who, without assets, right, um, they are usually left behind because what quantitative easing does is it's injecting money into the system. And usually the people who are receiving the money, the banks and the organizations and the people and they're buying up assets or showing up assets, those assets, right, are creating a rising in price. Price. So you have asset inflation, which is benefiting those right at the top or those who have access right to to asset ownership. Um, but it on the flip side, it actually is not benefiting those at the bottom very much because they don't have assets, right? And so you're creating an increased inequality gap. Now the Fed 
and the government knew this about quantitative easing before even COVID. Like this, you know, sure, it wasn't 100% proven, but it was pretty clear that, that it wasn't helping inequality and there was a negative impact. Yet, right, because of the, the so-called forced shutdown of the economy, the Fed and government was forced, so-called forced to do massive amounts of QE and money printing. Now, what's happened is we've seen the asset inflation, right? We've seen a ton of money, trillions of dollars, infiltrates the system going after a limited number of assets. Like how many assets are there in the world of high value, right? You've got real estate, which has, you know, increased like crazy. You've got equity stocks, right? Which has increased like crazy. You've got commodities, all this stuff. Um, and so it's a natural kind of flow, right? You're going to flood the system with money, these assets are going, to, are going to go up. Now, the other side of inflation or money printing is what's the impact on consumer goods, right? And inflation on just like items like your car and your food, your rental price, medicine, education, all this stuff. Now, for a long time, a lot of people have been saying, oh, all of that stuff, it's just transitory. It's just a, a small bump after COVID and it's all fine. However, we're getting more recent data and I'm finding actually more recent stats that is actually questioning that where... Um, yeah, I, I shared this um, before that in one of the neighborhoods I track closely in California, the rental prices, now this is just like a middle of the ground kind of California neighborhood that I track very closely, have jumped um, over 30% just in the past like 12 to 18 months. And it is so confusing. I've never seen such a big jump in rental prices um, in any like place, right? Um, in such a short period. And across the country, sure, it's there's each rental market is different. Like for example, San Francisco people are leaving, right? So the rental prices aren't gonna be that robust, but in a lot of part, in many parts of the country, um, rental prices have seen a big jump um, just the past one year. And you have big jumps in in various other prices of consumer goods and food, uh, cars, gasoline, et cetera. Now, the problem with this is if asset inflation, if inflation was just limited to assets, then at least consumer goods, rent, rent, medical care, education can be, you know, hopefully um, shielded right from inflation. Then that sucks for the 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 lower class, in a sense that the inequality is growing, but it it's t increasingly and it's worse than that if also the prices of consumer goods actually trend up. Now that's what we're starting to see um, in, the, in recent months. And this is causing, I think, one of the biggest crises of our generation. And that is the entire lower class, those without access to assets, right? Um, they're the ones ending up being oppressed by all of this because the prices are increasing faster than their wages. What are the politicians and what are the, what's the government doing, all about, doing about this? And this is where Elon Musk and this debate about his taxes, but also the government's role all plays a part. The politicians are, I'm not saying all of them, but there's a group of politicians and so-called scholars who blame billionaires for not paying their fair share and who are the culprits of wealth inequality. And so Elon Musk, because he's vocal on Twitter, right, he's a larger than life personality in some ways, he becomes a poster child for this argument, right, that Elon Musk isn't paying his taxes. But when you work out the math, like I'm doing here in my tweet thread in this video, Elon Musk will be paying billions, right, of dollars. Um, and a huge percent of his assets are going to taxes, right? He will be paying like unheard, like unheard amount of crazy amount of taxes. And I think targeting Elon Musk is just the the craziest thing because it doesn't make any sense, right? Why target someone who's going to pay 50% in, uh, in taxes for a large part of his assets in, in this year and also in coming years? And I think it's all to distract from a bigger problem at hand. The bigger problem at hand is the government is spending like there is no tomorrow and they're having a hard time to stop their spending. And they're justifying they're justified, they're justifying their continued spending spree. Now, I think some spending is necessary and good. I personally think if you are too stingy as a government to spend, you could hurt the growth of the economy and the future of the economy. So you want to invest in the future, right? As a country, you want to invest in education, in economic opportunity, right? In the right types of infrastructure, infrastructure that creates opportunity, fair um, opportunity for people. But you don't want to do, I think, government spending and just freewheeling uh, government spending as a crutch just to appease political groups and to gain re-election. And this is the bigger or even going underneath more. The bigger problem is free spending, government spending is actually liked by both sides of the aisle. 
the left gets to their social programs and the right gets to see asset price rising. And so the left and the right might disagree with a million things, right? You might think they're the world apart, but when it gets comes to the point of let's spend more and more money, right? Print more and more money. Generally, there's an agreement, right? They go, yeah, that's going to win votes. That's going to appease people. And I don't know if people are thinking through the consequences, right? The result of creating more and more inequality in our system. And the, the distressing part is you're making it tougher and tougher for those already in economic stagnation, those who've been left out the past 10 or 20 years, whose wages aren't keeping up. They're now not getting a fair opportunity because their rent is increasing, their medical bills are increasing, their food is increasing, and all of the stuff is increasing at a faster rate than their wages because their job isn't in high demand. So divide up jobs into two things. If you have a job that is in high demand, meaning it's a skilled job that you know uh, many companies want, et cetera, you're generally protected from inflation because your job and your skills will still be in demand and your wages will increase accordingly. So you don't have to worry about inflation in a sense. But there are a lot of jobs where you're just not in high demand, right? They could be easily replaced, et cetera. And these type of jobs are not protected with inflation. If inflation raises prices for consumer goods, for rent, for the basic needs of, of their life, their wages aren't going to keep up um, as fast. And you've got this incredible kind of inequality brewing, not just inequality, but the economic stagnation that people were facing the past 10 or 20 years is reaching new heights and screeching heights of even bordering oppression. And this is a huge, huge growing problem. I think it's probably one of the most pressing problems that we're going to be facing in the next decade. How are we going to solve this? How are we going to confront it? How are we going to deal with it? And most importantly, can we kind of uncover the noise and the blurriness and the cloudiness behind all this, all the politicalness um, behind all this? And can we get to real solutions? Can we find real solutions to real problems to really to help society actually come back together because this is um, perhaps one of the greatest uh, crises and hurdles that the US and other countries because many other countries are, are facing similar um, uh, crises as well. So anyways, hope this video has been helpful, got you thinking a bit, but if it has, go ahead, like and subscribe. All my vid videos can be found as an audio podcast. Just search for Dave Lee on investing in your favorite podcast player. I'm also on Twitter at HeyDave7. All right, we'll see you guys in my next video. Thanks.